With James Gunn writing and directing a movie about my favourite character in fiction, I've decided to immerse myself in all his comic book stuff, including the Peacemaker streaming show that I absolutely adore. So I thought today it would be fun if we actually ranked James Gunn's comic book stuff. We're going to start at the bottom of the pile and go to the very top so we can have some tension and drama. And after I've finished doing that, um, then we're going to discuss if I feel James Gunn can do an effective job, not only running DC Studios and the DC content that we need to be awesome and needs to appeal to everyone, but also with a film like Superman Legacy. Has he got the stuff after re-immersing myself in his comic book, you know, content, if you like, has he got the stuff? to make a Superman movie? That's always been my question because that for me is the most important question. So let's start at the bottom of the pile. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 isn't at the bottom of my list because I don't rate the film or I hate the film, I don't. I think it's a brilliant film, but this isn't the joyous occasion the first film was. It's a bit, it's a bit weird. I mean, you wouldn't compare it with The Dark Knight or Empire Strikes Back, but it has those darker themes. James still has a lot of music, brilliant music, playing in this movie. The opening is a lot of fun. There's still a lot of comedy in this movie, just not centred around Peter Quill so much. Because we find out that Peter Quill's father, played by Kurt Russell, is Igor is it Ego? Ego, not Ego, Ego! Ego, the living planet. And so we find out as the film goes on that this is a deadly, dark being, person. He's absolutely horrible. He doesn't have a, diff you know, he doesn't have a good part to his personality. Now this is interesting because James normally likes to do rounded stories about characters and showing that flawed characters can also be very, very good people and how they've been rejected by society. But Ego, the living planet, doesn't get that. He is basically the villain of this story. He is a bad person. He was the reason Peter's mother died. So it's everything. Then he tries to control his son. So James does do a lot of stories about father and son dynamics, and he does really do them really well. Unfortunately, it is a Hollywood disease these days to just call out bad dads, which is a shame, but there you have it. There are very good fathers out there, by the way. But anyway, Hollywood is an echo chamber. You know, Hollywood is run by some very, very bad men. So I get it right. They're screaming at the people who have abused them for all their careers. I get it, but it would be nice if people in Hollywood, creators in Hollywood, would make a movie about famine in the third world, or, you know, children being abused, or, you know, all the injustices in the world, apart from toxic masculinity. There's more going on in the world than that, but anyway, that's fine. So I really like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I like that it has a dark centre to it, and it really works for me. But I think a lot of people didn't like this movie. This movie made solid money. I think it made just under 800 million, did it? Not as much as the first movie. And of course, the bean counters were counting. I'm not talking about Disney or Fag or Marvel. They were happy with the movie and what it did. The box office is still good. I think that people wanted to see the same movie as the first movie. It's why people don't like the Star Wars prequel trilogy because it's not the same as the first trilogy. Because basically the prequels actually challenge you a lot deeper than the first lot of movies do. I know people will laugh at that, but that's what I believe. There's deep themes, deeper themes in those prequel movies and darker themes, especially, you know, Revenge of the Sith and what happens to Anakin. But, you know, I think that's the problem these days. You know, we went, when The Dark Knight came out, everyone wanted more darkly centred, you know, comic book movies. 
But then when the first Avengers came out, everyone was going, yeah, light, fun, you know. You know, and there's still dark moments in the first Avengers movie, but not too much. So these days, people get a bit triggered by dark stuff. We saw what happened and how people reacted to the Snyderverse. It's not just a dark tone that pissed people off about the Snyderverse. It's certain liberties taken with these DC characters. You know, I love Snyder and I love the Snyderverse. We're not here to talk about that today. We've done it before. We'll do it again, I'm quite sure. So I really like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, but it is bottom of my list. So then we go to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which again is a very good movie. It's not near the bottom of my list because I don't like it. I just like other movies better. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 brings in another pet subject of James Gunn, and he always does this so well. Animal cruelty. But you can look at a lot of the commentary he does with animal cruelty and look at it as child cruelty as well. So we get a lot of flashbacks of Rocket in Guardians of the, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. In fact, this is really Rocket's movie. And that's a good thing because Rocket has always been my favourite character in James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. And I think in a lot of ways, it's probably James Gunn's favourite character as well. But we get this fully rounded story in this final movie for Rocket, and it's so good. We see the cruelty enacted towards Rocket and why he is the personality that he is. And this is what James Gunn is good at. He takes flawed characters and he shows you where those flaws came from. He does the same thing with Peacemaker, which we'll get into. In fact, Rocket is probably his Peacemaker in the, you know, in the Marvel Universe. So it's a very good film and you get a real, you know, obviously the CG for Rocket is always amazing. Um, but Bradley Cooper's performance, as always, is sensational. Bradley Cooper is a great actor. I predicted success for him as soon as I saw him at first in the Alias TV show basically created by J.J. Abrams. When, and we all loved J.J. back then. I still love J.J. for what he gave us in television. I actually like Star Trek 2009, and I think The Force Awakens is okay in places. But anyway, again, we're not here to talk about J.J. Abrams. So it's a very, it's a sadder film. Again, it's a more somber film. Again, it does have the normal James Gunn comedy, which, you know, James Gunn comedy is either hilariously funny or a little bit funny. Um, I don't normally think, oh, that wasn't very funny, but sometimes he's, you know, laughs are not always there for big laugh out loud moments. And so it's got that mixture, but there's a, again, like Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, it has this central dark, it has this dark centre to it. And I like dark centres to my stories, but I like films to have a mixture of tones rather than just one tone. So I like in the middle to have a few, you know, laughs and gags. It works the way James Gunn does his stories. But this really is about a person who was abused really as a child and, he, and used, not just, you know, not just abused and tortured, but used. And, you know, this is why Rocket is the way he is. And it really is amazing. Because, I, I mean, James Gunn could be making... If you look, think about all James Gunn's movies, it's like we're going into a, children, a children's home with rejected children who've been abused and stuff, and he's making films of, of them, but as adults. That's the kind of thing he's really doing here. It's Look, he's a very, very talented writer-director. I've said this many times, and this is why every time I criticise him, I always make sure to say that he's, I really rate him as a writer-director. Because I do. I've said this in previous videos. You can criticise someone about one thing, but compliment him about something else. And people say, well, you're a flip-flop. And I've said this before, but it kind of annoys me that you can't say a nice thing about someone, then be slightly negative about them. That's what I am. I'm a balanced dude, right? Anyway, so Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is second to last on my list. So, I suppose at the moment you could kind of think, well, Mick, really? Should they be bottom of your list? Where are the DC movies? Anyway, 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 as I say, 
This is not a straightforward list. This is how I see things. So next in line is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, which I'm sure would be on most people's top of the rankings. It's not top of my rankings because I don't think it's the best piece of comic book content he's ever made. But I absolutely adore this movie. All I can say about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1, and at the time it was so hyped, overhyped, everyone was in love with James Gunn. I'd never heard of him before Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. Um, and I hate popular things. At first, when something popular comes out, I reject it. Oh, God, fuck off. Overhyped and all that. So I didn't, you know, I didn't watch it for ages. But when, when I did watch it, I, I remember feeling so positive and confident. And I was walking around, you know, like I was Peter Quill and his newfound friends with a strut. I've got a feeling, you know, brilliant film, full of energy, full of positivity. And again, does what James Gunn's stories do at their core. It looks at flawed people and how they're not so bad. And shows you how we shouldn't reject people. How we shouldn't just prejudge people. And it's clear that James Gunn maybe has dealt with this with his own friends and himself. And maybe he and his friends are those types of people who were kind of at first rejected from society. It makes sense. And I, as I say, I appreciate his style of filmmaking and storytelling. Because James can do the visual very well. But James isn't about the vision. When people talk about James Gunn, they don't say, oh my God, he's such, you know, his strength is his visual storytelling. It's not about that with James. It's about emotions. It's about taking characters, groups of people who have been rejected from society. And this was the first movie. And people had never really seen this before. You know, uh, there's a film called, what is it, The Breakfast Club from the 80s or something like that. But you don't, you don't really see films like this about groups of people who have been rejected from society. And he does this in every one of his films in terms of his comic book movies, because that's what we're talking about today. It's got great space action. It's probably the best Star Wars film we've seen in a, lo a long time. Don't get me wrong. It's not, apart from being set in space, it's not really like Star Wars. Um, although, when you think about Peter Quill's father... Peter Quill is kind of the Luke Skywalker, and Ego is kind of, even though Ego's not in the first film, you know, like Darth Vader, in a way. But ultimately, it's a very different story, and it's made in a different way. I would have always been fascinated to see what James Gunn would have done with a Star Wars movie. A lot better than these people, you know, who are working on Star Wars right now. I still am under the opinion that no one, will ever be able to make Star Wars successful because I think it's a bit like the secret recipe to Coca-Cola. Nobody knows that recipe but George Lucas. He made six movies, they should have left it at that. But of course companies want to make money and I understand that. So yeah, the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, the first one, is amazing. It's great cinema. It's just about having a little bit of emotion, having a lot of fun and getting to know these characters that you fall in love with. And that's it. That's what James Gunn does. But he does it in a level where you can watch it within the confines of a Disney Marvel Studios movie. And he does an excellent job. And the movie did well, over 800 million. And his name was up in lights because of it. I really like Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 1. So, they're the three Guardians movies that a lot of people will be saying, well, they're his three best movies but I don't agree in it within this ranking. So next, it's James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Um, I think this is an outstanding picture. I think it's a better picture than all three Guardians movies put together, even though I've just said that I love them, and I do. The Suicide Squad is, a, I mean, if I remember rightly, it was an R-rated picture, wasn't it? And I think that probably hurt the box office as well, because it was during covid very difficult to get people out for an R-rated picture like that. I think the movie would have made about 500, 600 million, which I think would have been very, very solid. As I've said before, James Gunn has never made a billion dollar picture. Well, with Superman Legacy, he's going to have to. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. And so, yeah, I love The Suicide Squad. Again, James Gunn gets a group of people, you know, that have been rejected from society and makes them likeable 
and makes them fully rounded. But he makes a very, very interesting decision because he said this wasn't a direct sequel to David Ayer's Suicide Squad, even though it's not what we saw wasn't David Ayer's movie. I understand that. But in a lot of ways, it is a sequel to the, f the one we saw in cinemas, the first one. It is a sequel. You know, you've got Captain Boomerang. You, you know, you've got Rick Flagg. You've got Harley Quinn. They know each other from the first movie, right? It is a slight continuation. So it is a sequel to the first movie. It's not like we didn't have a big, you know, we, they don't continue the cliffhanger from, you know, the Joker breaking Harley out of Belle Reeve or anything, but it is a sequel of some sorts. And I think James handles, because it's difficult, because that film wasn't reviewed well, made loads of money, right? But wasn't reviewed well. And a lot of people don't like that movie. Personally, I do like the theatrical cut of um, that original theatrical cut of the first Suicide Squad movie. But anyway, so again, it's interesting because he's a big Suicide Squad fan, and I think he puts this film together beautifully. The action, the cinematography, uh, cinema, cinema, cinematography. Yeah, that's how you say it, cinematography. The cinematography is absolutely stunning. It's R-rated, so we get a bit of blood. It's such a good movie. Not a good movie, I think it's a great movie. And he does, he makes this very interesting decision. He casts former wrestler, John Cena, as Peacemaker. Another character we haven't heard of. This is something else the guy is so good at in terms of James Gunn. He takes unknown characters, creates them in a rounded style, and he makes them famous. He made, you know, he made all the Guardians characters famous. He made Peacemaker famous. But let's stick to Peacemaker in the Suicide Squad first. He's a one-dimensional character in the Suicide Squad. He's a jerk. He's an asshole. He just kills people, right? He ultimately kills Rick Flagg. I don't really want to talk about that yet because that's really dealt with a lot more. The after effects of that in the Peacemaker TV streaming series in a very interesting way. So... One thing I'll say before we even get to Peacemaker is that John Cena proves he's a fucking outstanding actor. And I'm shocked that a former wrestler is that good of an actor, but he really is. Don't even compare him with The Rock. The Rock just plays The Rock. This guy is something fucking special and a pretty good stand-up human being as well from everything that I hear. But then you've got, like, Idris Elba as Bloodsport. Brilliant! Danielle Melchior is adorable as Ratcatcher too. She captured my heart. And then you've got Peter Capaldi as The Thinker. It's such an excellent film. The action is amazing. But then we look at the villain. Who is the villain of The Suicide Squad? That's an interesting debate, isn't it? Because, you know, you've got this creature. Again, it's about child animal cruelty. This creature is being experimented on. This, you know, they're using this creature's DNA. And, you know, and they're using the fear of this creature as well. And the thinker has been torturing this, you know, this, you know, this creature, Starro, for so many years. And what happens is, and it's that moral that James Gunn always deals with, if you kick something or someone enough, in the end, it will kick back. And I love that element. Ultimately, Starro isn't the villain of this story, even though they have to stop Starro from destroying, you know, Cortimates or whatever they call the place, right? And, you know, that he can't get out because the world would be fucked, right? You can see what the character can do. What I love about what James Gunn does with Starro, he absolutely sticks with Starro from the comics mostly. He even embraced the colours of the bright colours of what he has in the comics. And I think that is important. I've, you know, I've said this many times. If you're going to adapt iconic existing IPs and characters, stick with the basics. You can change a few things. Smallville stuck with the basics of who Clark Kent is in the comics and just changed a few bits of pieces of canon here or there. Lex Luthor, you know, working in Smallville and becoming Clark's friend. Well, actually, 
they did become friends in a Superboy comic as well until his jealousy of Superboy, you know, Lex Luthor's, you know, overcomes him. So there's some similarities from the comics there as well. But Smallville changed a lot of stuff, but it didn't change what its characters were and what they were supposed to be. So that's what I like. If you're going to take Superman, you can change things around him, but you can't darken him up. You can't make him a killer. You can't have him growling at his villain as he's beating him up, right? It's Superman has to be Superman. You can make changes around Superman and his characters, but at the end of the day, when you're adapting characters, you can change a few things, but not the characters themselves. Otherwise, you should just go and tell a story about a different character. Um, so I really appreciate that with Starro as well. So Starro is the villain, but isn't the villain of the Suicide Squad. The CG again is fucking outstanding. If you haven't listened to the, you know, the DVD, Blu-ray, 4K, whatever commentary of the Suicide Squad, it's very, very educational and really puts you in the mind of James Gunn. Amazing guy. He's an amazing guy. I know some people don't like him, but he's got, we know he's got a lot to say for himself, but he's a very good writer director. You can deny that as much as you want, but he is. So the Suicide Squad, for me, is his best film. It's his best comic book movie to date. It's a shame it didn't make any money, but it wasn't because it was a bad movie or because people didn't want to see it. There was a COVID shutdown. It was R-rated. It was difficult. It did really well on Max. Now, my favourite piece of comic book content from James Gunn ever is his Peacemaker. Peacemaker, again, gives you the structure of a group of people rejected from society. This, as I say, is his best work. The performance from John Cena may be one of the most amazing performances in any comic book live action story I've ever seen. He clearly is a very talented man. His performance is amazing. You don't like him that much. You don't despise him, but you don't like him that much in the Suicide Squad because that's the way you're supposed to feel. But when you get to Peacemaker, James and John make sure that you start seeing a more rounded character and it becomes very, very interesting. He's funny, you want to be his friend, you want to listen to his music, you want to hang out with Peacemaker, he's a bit of a laugh. But like all James's movies, there is commentary on toxic masculinity because these people are obsessed with toxic masculinity. As I said earlier, it's they think it's the number one problem in the world and if you solve toxic masculinity, you know, everything else will be all right. Because they think that it's only men that are the problem no woman has ever committed a crime or ever cheated on their partners no you know no minority person has ever committed a crime or done anything wrong it's just straight white males unfortunately and i feel sorry and bad for them that they think this way but this is how extremists think at the end of the day but that's fine i still love james gunn as a writer director that doesn't change and people have the right to believe politically whatever they want, but it can be frustrating at times, especially if you're a straight guy yourself and you're none of those things that they claim that you are. But anyway, it doesn't matter. We're here to talk about this, so we're going to continue to talk about this. Uh, but yeah, so he gives us a more rounded character. We get to know the, you know, the real Christopher Smith. We find out that him and Bloodsport have got a lot in common, just like Bloodsport was tortured by his own father and locked in a cupboard full of rats or whatever it was, while Peacemaker's abuse by his father is even worse. Again, you know, these people love to tell stories about straight white males who are racist, but it is done very, very well in this story. Robert Patrick gives an outstanding performance of this character, this hateful, despicable father who made his two little boys fight with each other and one son by accident killed the other son and they were close brothers. And it's clear that, you know, Christopher Smith Peacemaker loved his brother. He killed him as a little boy by accident in a fist fight. His dad and his friends, his redneck friends were gambling on. Um, and of course the father blamed Chris Peacemaker for this. So he's been living with this all his life. And this is part of his vow 
he made as a little boy. If he's going to kill anyone, it's going to be for a good reason. So he believes that he killed, you know, he killed Rick Flagg for a good reason. Because from his point of view, he was told not to let that, that information leave Quartered Mortis. So, so he didn't. But ultimately, he did something. He, he, he loved Rick Flagg. He looked up to Rick Flagg. He didn't kill him because he hated him. He killed him because he felt he had to. This is the character. He's a soldier. All he's ever known is orders. So he follows orders. But in Peacemaker, he gets set up by Walla as we're introduced to Adebayo, which is Walla's daughter, which I didn't even know she had a daughter. I don't know if it was created by James Gunn or if she's part of the comics. Anyway, again, this there's not a bad actor, a bad performance in this series. But let's talk about Jen Holland. Everyone is triggered by Jen Holland being in James Gunn's stuff because she was his girlfriend and now they're married. Welcome to showbiz, everyone. I grew up in the business. I grew up in the world. This is how it works. This is how all worlds work. You know, titans of industry put their own kids and friends in their businesses, right? It's what happens and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, if Jen was an awful actor, I'd agree with you all being triggered. But bloody hell, Jen Holland is actually a really, really good actor. And her performance as Amelia Harcourt, firstly in The Suicide Squad, but even more so in Peacemaker, is absolutely outstanding. She is really co-lead with John Cena in this show. And she eats up the scenery. She's absolutely fantastic. I don't understand the hate for her just because she's with James Gunn and she got this job. Yeah, somebody else would have got this job if she wasn't with James. But it doesn't matter. All that matters is what you're seeing works for you. You're entertained by it. And you, you know, you're immersed by the performances of the actors. And Jen gives immersive performances in both The Suicide Squad, but especially Peacemaker. So again, this is about, you know, you've got characters like John Economist, who's this overweight guy who dyes his beard, and he denies he dyes his beard, because Peacemaker calls him dye beard. And you get that brilliant scene in the end where he's pretending to be taken over by, you know, the butterflies, and they ask him, what, why did he dye his beard? And he explains that he basically thought if he'd never had sex before and if he dyed his beard he'd get a result but he was so lazy he never dyed it properly and he thought nobody would ever notice but then he said one guy did so throughout the whole series he feels like peacemaker is calling him out but ultimately by peacemaker bullying him in a way peacemaker was the only one who ever noticed he dyed his beard so yes He's being bullied by Peacemaker, which is wrong, but also Peacemaker notices people. He doesn't ignore people. Then, Jesus Christ. I mean, look, I just spoke earlier about changing characters fundamentally, but James Gunn ch changes Vigilante, aka Adrian Chase, dramatically. And I said earlier, so I'm gonna be a hypocrite here, he, tra he changes his character dramatically, but oh boy, is what he does with this character amazing? I suppose the difference is he's not Clark Kent. He's not as famous as Clark Kent. You can take liberties with someone as lesser known as Vigilante. But the guy who plays him, and I forgot his name, but he's a British actor. Um, wow. Absolutely fantastic. And we're going to see more of him in the DCU, which I'm very excited about. But all these characters in this show, all these actors did a great job. Again, it's a bunch of flawed people who are rejected by society. That scene when he thinks eagerly, his pet eagle, his best friend in the world, is going to die. And he prays to God that he doesn't. It's a very, very thought-provoking moment. And this is the kind of thing that James Gunn does so well. The reveal of Peacemaker killing his brother as a boy. Utterly compelling. The fight between Peacemaker and his father, outstanding. There's so many outstanding moments in this series. It is, in my opinion, James Gunn's greatest piece of work. 
and I loved it. So saying all of that, these films basically have the same themes in them, but treated very, very differently. People like the way James Gunn does what he does. So taking all that, putting that to one side, does that mean he can do a great job at DC Studios? Can he make a great Superman movie? Considering all he's done in the comic book genre is tell stories about flawed groups of people. So Superman is a very different kind of thing to do. You can't do that. So when it comes to creature commandos and the authority, we know he's going to kill it. Because again, it's going to be about groups of people. He's good at doing stories, as we've been talking about in the past half an hour, doing stories about flawed groups of people. But he's never had a challenge like Superman in his life. This is a big deal. He was always going to write a Superman movie. He then became co-CEO of DC Studios and now he's writing and directing it. It's his baby. His name's on the Superman door and the buck stops with him. I don't know if he can make a great Superman movie. But here's the thing. I know, as I said earlier, he's a really good writer-director. So he's got a chance of making a great Superman movie the James Gunn way. No, not the Dick Donner way, not the Brian Singer way, not the Zack Snyder way. He's not Zack Snyder. Why should he be? He's going to use his people because he's his own person and he wants his own Superman and he wants his own Lois Lane and he has every right to do that. It's unfair what happened to Zack Snyder. I don't believe that's James Gunn's fault, by the way. We've got to be open and, you know, practical about these situations. Yes, and I still believe James Gunn didn't handle the releases of these DCEU movies very well. But again, he's a very good writer, director. That anything that's happened this year doesn't change that. So my thinking right now is that I'm a lot, a little bit more confident about him writing and directing a great Superman movie and being successful with the DCU. At this moment, I'm immersing myself in James Gunn content and I'm kind of feeling a lot more positive about the situation. He has a chance. I'm not saying he's definitely going to be successful. What I'm saying to you is there's, at this moment, I'm feeling a lot more positive about the situation than I was a few weeks ago, a month ago and a few months ago as we get into this. Look, we don't know what's going to happen and it's no point saying it's going to be bad and fail because we don't know if that's the case or not. But one thing's for sure, he's a very good writer-director, and potentially he could do a really, really good job here. And the great thing is, we know he loves these characters as well.